This odd machine transformed the very nature of war by replacing the cornerstone of ancient warfare. The horse. For 4,000 years of recorded history, the horse was the primary vehicle that the army used to carry equipment, transport troops. It was good off-road terrain vehicle. It was the fastest thing alive at that point for warfare. So it, it performed splendidly for 4,000 years. But horses required grooming, exercise, nourishment, and training. And like the soldiers they served, horses were often casualties of war. In World War I, a dark innovation in combat would revolutionize mobility. Mechanized warfare. The bloody battlegrounds of the Great War were the proving grounds for dozens of new machines. From the Ford Model T to the Mark I tank. When 19th century strategy confronted these 20th century weapons, the result was catastrophic. We deployed horse cavalry to Europe in World War I. The theory was that uh, we would somehow, with infantry, punch a hole through the uh, German defenses, and in comes the cavalry, and they would go back and swing their sabers and do whatever this cavalry does when it gets in the enemy's rear. And it didn't work that way. Although primitive, these new machines often became effective replacements for the horse. The horse could not uh, keep up with the motor vehicle. They would not tire, they would not require food. But the machines of the First World War had one fatal flaw. Trucks and tanks started taking over the personnel carrying, the munitions carrying, and now the only thing that the horse could do that all of this other equipment could not do was effectively go cross country in the mud. By war's end, no military had solved this dilemma. But military strategists were convinced that a highly mobile vehicle would be instrumental to future victories. After the war, they all set out to invent the world's first mechanical horse. The U.S. military made several attempts to build such a machine in the 1920s and 1930s. One design in particular generated high hopes. The snake in the grass vehicle was a very low profile vehicle. It resembled in, in, in many ways like a kid's go-kart that two grown men could lay down on in a prone position, face forward. One was the driver, the other one had a 30 caliber machine gun mounted. So this thing was so low that it could just run through the grass and you couldn't see it. But the vehicle's low clearance made it impossible to traverse rough terrain and proved impractical for the battlefield. The snake in the grass acquired the less than flattering nickname, Belly Flopper. Despite numerous efforts, by the late 1930s, the horse remained the U.S. Army's most reliable mode of cross-country transportation. Time was about to run out. September 1st, 1939, the face of war is changed as the Nazi forces slash into Poland. By 1940, Adolf Hitler's forces had swept through Poland, Belgium, and France, conquering land faster than any army in history. Germany, defeated in World War I, understood the importance of mechanization. And by World War II, they perfected it. The Germans were the, really the only ones to seize on the on the, the singular opportunity that the tanks and armored forces represented. The Blitzkrieg, or lightning strike strategy, was the culmination of years of research and preparation and built upon a highly mobile fleet of machines. In 
Elite panzers and Stuka bombers sliced through Europe, reinforced by the swift and revolutionary reconnaissance car, the Kubelwagen. The German Kubelwagen, which essentially means bucket car in German, or bucket wagon, uh, came out of the development of the 1930s uh, Volkswagen. They produced this very open, buckety, ugly-looking type of a body that went on top of the regular Volkswagen chassis. Its innovative design and impressive speed made the Kubelwagen one of the most effective vehicles in Germany's arsenal. As Adolf Hitler's armored divisions took continental Europe by storm, the United States was forced to reckon with its own shortcomings in armored development, including a shocking deficiency of tanks, and still no replacement for the horse. All through the 1930s, the government was really working on this concept of replacing the horse, and as uh, because of the Blitzkrieg, it became very important that we put something into place to do that because we just could not stand up against the German army with on horseback like we were at the time. You're dealing with, with relatively ancient technology here and with technology that we knew was pretty fragile on the battlefield and we needed to do better. In the coming months, the U.S. Army desperately attempted to fill the gap in its arsenal. The solution would come from the unlikeliest of places a private company with only 15 employees on the verge of bankruptcy. As the war ravaged Europe in the summer of 1940, the U.S. Army finally drew up specifications for a new reconnaissance vehicle, able to compete with Germany's Kubelwagen. The list described a machine unlike anything ever built. The government was initially looking for a vehicle that didn't have any more than a 75-inch wheelbase and wasn't more than 36 inches tall. It also had to carry a 500-pound payload, yet the weight of the vehicle could be no more than 1,000 pounds. The most daunting specification of all, however, was the Army's deadline. They wanted this done in 49 days. That's taking a vehicle in concept and producing a prototype and have it delivered in 49 days and if you didn't get it there on time you were going to be fined per day by the government. The army frantically requested bids from 135 American civilian auto and truck manufacturers. The daunting deadline and specifications scared away all but two. The successful Willys Overland in Toledo, Ohio and the tiny American Bantam car company of Butler, Pennsylvania. Though the odds were against them, American Bantam was the lone company to make the cut. It was an uphill battle from the beginning. The president of American Bantam Company decided that he wanted to go after this bid. However, American Bantam Car Company in Butler, Pennsylvania only had approximately 15 employees at the time, none of which were engineers. Looking to fill the void, American Bantam courted Carl Probst, a talented engineer from Detroit. They approached Probst and said, Carl, we've got 49 days, produce a vehicle from nothing, and we have no money. Well, Probst turned around, and his first several reactions were, you guys are nuts. Lured by the challenge, Probst accepted Bantam's offer. On Wednesday, July 17, 1940, Probst and the head of the Bantam team, Harold Christ, set to work. The effort continued around the clock for the next five weeks. The only way I could describe what they were doing is I would call ruthless engineering. If they didn't have it on the shelf and they couldn't find it easily, they would send people out to forage and pick up whatever they had, bring it back into the shop and modify it. These guys were motivated and they were smart people. Fenders were fabricated by hand. Hoods were dragged from junkyards. Other vital components were cannibalized from older Bantam vehicles. So September 1st rolled around and these guys are looking at each other with stuff all over the floor, the pieces aren't together, and they're just saying, we aren't going to be able to do it. It's impossible. The deadline, 5 p.m. September 23rd, 1940. 
By the night of the 22nd, the team had accomplished all they could. They called their prototype the BRC, the Bantam Reconnaissance Car. Next morning, they mounted up, they drove it at 25 miles an hour in a totally untested vehicle just to break, break the engine in. With only half an hour to spare, the Bantam team delivered their new invention to Camp Hollaberg, the Army's testing ground in Maryland. No one had ever seen anything like it. Boy, look at that. You know, this, this is state-of-the-art technology. And the first thing they did was they hopped in and just kind of preliminarily drove around, and everybody was like all excited about it. The bigger question was, would it work? To find out, they put six additional prototypes through grueling tests. They basically beat the living daylights out of the thing. They just went into the woods, they went up and down hills, they loaded it up, they put people in it, they tried everything that they could think of to see what this thing could do, and they were just totally flabbergasted because it did so much more than they expected it to do. Equipped with four-wheel drive, a new invention at the time, the BRC easily climbed and descended the steepest grades. The powerful engine, a Continental Y4112, gave the BRC the unprecedented ability to tow nearly half of its own weight. The Bantam design was simple, rugged, and an astounding success. One of the first officers to drive it predicted, this unit will make history. Bantam's persistence had paid off. This is part of the American character, the seat of the pants uh, ability to take a concept and deal with it and, and bring it to fruition. And other nations couldn't do that. And I think it's part of the American spirit. It's a, it's a can-do uh, uh, feeling, a uh, can-do spirit. Unfortunately for Bantam, turning in the winning car did not win them the prized production contract. The Quartermaster Corps was saying, we have a war to win and we're not worried about what's fair necessarily, but we need the biggest guy, the best guy, to get this on time and delivered in a quality fashion. And therefore, they went with the larger companies. With the threat of imminent war, the Army gave the final production contracts to Bantam's original competitor, Willys Overland, and another automotive giant, the Ford Motor Company. Bantam was awarded a smaller contract, manufacturing trailers to be pulled behind the vehicle they had designed. The first 16,000 vehicles rolled off the Ford and Willys Overland assembly line in November 1941. Manufacturers experimented with names for the vehicle, like Blitz Buggy, Peep, and Midget. But the Willys MB and Ford's GPW simply became known as the Jeep. Based on the original Bantam design, the Jeep was an engineering wonder. What you're looking at now is a Willys MB Jeep. One of the things the Army wanted were pioneer tools, an axe and a shovel. Also down here, these are combat rims. If you had a flat tire, instead of using a tire machine, you would have to split these rims in half, put a tire in, and then bolt them back together, and that could be done in the field. Over here on the side of the body are some handles for manhandling feature that the government was looking for so GIs could move the vehicle around when it got stuck. Another interesting device that they came up with the Jeep was this uh, manual hand crank. In case your starter didn't work, you weren't out of luck because you could just hook this into the front of the engine and then crank the vehicle to get it started. This is the blackout lighting system where you can go anywhere from having regular lights as you do on an automobile to just some of the lights, to just the blackout lights, to an absolute blackout where no lights are on in the vehicle at all. This is a spare jerry can or gas can, which carries five gallons of gasoline. The driver sat on top of 15 gallons of gas that you filled up in a gas tank like that. Inside, interestingly, are these uh, nifty hand wipers that both the driver and the passenger had to operate depending on who had their hands free. You could just unhook the headlight flip it up and maneuver it so you could work on the famous four-cylinder 
134 cubic inch, 60 horsepower Go Devil engine. Then during the day, if you had a problem with uh, aircraft, you were under an aircraft attack or something like that, you would basically put this cover on and tie it around, put the headlight back down so that no sunlight could glint off of the glass and tip aircraft off as to where your location was. This is the mechanical horse. This is what the Army was looking for to replace the horse, and it did a superb job. Just a fantastic vehicle. But before the U.S. was able to deliver the new vehicle to European allies, everything suddenly changed. December 7th, 1941. Only one month after the first jeeps rolled off the assembly line, the U.S. was finally, inextricably, at war. After more than three years of anticipation and dread, American soldiers and their new jeeps would soon be deployed to war in staggering numbers. December 7th, 1941. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, brought every U.S. citizen to full attention. United States soil had been breached, and the country was now committed to an all-out war effort. On December 29th, the government sent the Ford Motor Company a contract to produce 63,000 Jeeps. To accomplish the feat, each of its five plants would have to turn out an average of 500 per week. Willie's Overland Company was to produce thousands more. When the Jeeps arrived on the battlefields of Asia and Europe, soldiers quickly became dependent on them. My God, we used it for everything. Each platoon had, the platoon leader had a Jeep. The theory was we were supposed to ride around and make contact with the infantry that we were supposed to support. It was a great step forward. The Jeep's ingeniously simple design was one of its greatest assets. Because it was so adaptable, resourceful GIs and engineers immediately invented new uses for it. Some ideas were a little too far ahead of their time. When soldiers in Asia and Europe discovered that the Jeep was hampered by deep water, they improvised several techniques that enabled the Jeep to cross rivers and streams. None of them were very simple. The Ford Motor Company constructed a waterproof hull around the Jeep's exterior and called the experiment the General Purpose Amphibious Vehicle, or GPAV. But it proved ultimately unusable on the battlefield. While the GPAV swam like a sea lion, the additional 1,000 pounds of waterproofing materials slowed the vehicle to a crawl. Another little-known and equally curious Jeep innovation was called the Roto Buggy. Equipping the Jeep with rotors and an aerodynamic tail, Army engineers designed the Roto Buggy to fly itself to remote locations. But the flying Jeep never really made it off the ground. Jeep alterations made in the field were usually more successful. Nearly 1,000 miles from the European front, in the deserts of North Africa, the Jeep was modified to play one of its most crucial roles. By the spring of 1942, Germany's infamous General Erwin Rommel had invaded Egypt and was rapidly sweeping eastward across North Africa. In response, the Allied Air Force relentlessly bombed German targets. But an air campaign alone was not enough to stop Germany's powerful army. Their solution would become the stuff of legend, the SAS. Glamorized by the 1960s television series Rat Patrol, the SAS, or Special Air Services, was an elite division of the British Army that mounted swift, clandestine assaults on German targets in Africa. Their weapon of choice was the most reliable vehicle in their arsenal. The U.S. Army Jeep. It was camouflaged the color of sand, and rigged with extra gas and water cans. 
which allowed the SAS to operate behind enemy lines for unprecedented periods of time. But the most significant SAS innovation involved weaponry. For the first time, the Jeep was used as an attack vehicle. Equipped with 50 caliber Brownings and twin Vickers machine guns, the SAS Jeeps had the deadly capability of firing thousands of rounds per minute. There's several stories of them coming into air bases and just running down the airfields and just blowing up every plane they could see in sight and run back out and come out with no casualties because they were so light and quick and, uh, and adept at desert warfare. The SAS's unrelenting raids eventually helped defeat the Germans on the African front. This enabled the Allies to advance, setting the stage for the invasion of Normandy, where the Jeep would once again play a crucial role. This is the day for which free people long have waited. This is D-Day. June 6, 1944. The Allies invaded Normandy, France, in an all-out attempt to defeat Germany. After two months of brutal fighting, the Allies gained a stronghold on the French and Belgian coast. In their pursuit of the rapidly retreating German army, thousands of U.S. Sherman tanks consumed more than 800,000 gallons of fuel daily. Supplying the rapidly moving armor proved nearly impossible because trains in the region had been destroyed. There was a great deal of gasoline and supplies in the Normandy area. There was more than enough to supply all the armies. Normandy was just bristling with depots of all types. Gasoline by the, the thousands of gallons. But they couldn't get it to the front fast enough. Enter the Jeep. The Army initially outfitted Jeeps with locomotive wheels and used them to transport supplies via rail lines. When this failed to keep up with the demand, the Allied commanders devised an ingenious transportation line called the Red Ball Express. To Red Ball something was to FedEx it or to uh, send it priority mail. When you uh, said you wanted something red balled, you wanted it to get it there as quickly as possible. And of course, that was a term that the Army used. The Red Ball Express utilized nearly every Jeep and truck in the area. The Red Ball was established August 25th, 1944. It was seat of the pants, uh, completely ad lib. They just started grabbing trucks, and within 36 hours, the first trucks were on the road. By the fourth day, some 6,000 trucks and jeeps began a one-way convoy, looping from the Cherbourg Peninsula to Paris and back. Manned mostly by African Americans, the Red Ball became an unstoppable force. The jeep was crucial to the Red Ball's success. The jeeps would ride herd and make sure that no one straggled. You'd have lead jeeps and rear jeeps. Uh, NCOs in the jeeps or officers and they were kind of like the sheepdogs. If you hadn't had the red ball I, I think it's safe to say that the war in Europe would have taken longer to win. You wouldn't have supplied these troops and the armies would have come to a halt. The jeep had begun its service in World War II as a simple solution to a daunting problem replacing the function of the horse. But by the war's end, due to its unfailing service, the Jeep had become the embodiment of the war effort. From Europe, to Africa, to Asia, the Allies' reliance on the Jeep to transport troops and supplies proved crucial in the defeat of the Axis powers. It was the American ability to harness its industrial power and put it into machines, whether it be a Jeep or a truck, 
was what won the war for the Americans, for the Allies. There's no doubt that uh, the Jeep definitely had a major effect on the war. I think uh, Eisenhower had at one time uh, quoted that there were three major things that had really saved us in the war and allowed us to do what we did, and one of the three was the Jeep. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that those 49 days, if those guys hadn't accomplished what they did, we would not be sitting here in the same world today. But the Jeep's service would not end with World War II. Its most challenging days were yet to come. Nineteen forty five. The war was over. The victors were home. And the Jeep began its life as a civilian. The Jeep became a very popular vehicle. There were articles written about it. It just became an overnight sensation and a legend. Um, Every one of these GIs that came in as a young kid in the Army, 17, 18 years old, an entire generation said, look at this thing, I just love it, it's great. You know, they became so attached to them, it was almost as if they owned a horse and it was part of their, their uh, equipment. As the war was coming to a close after D-Day, everybody, Willys, Ford, everybody was thinking about, let's take this thing and capitalize, because when these old guys all get out, there's a market for them to buy it. Starting in 1944, Willys Overland started doing testing on civilian-type Jeeps. Willys Overland, one of the Jeep's original manufacturers, created the convertible Jeepster and the wagon. Build as the ultimate family vehicles. Even the U.S. Postal Service was eager to buy the Jeep. Between 1944 and 1947, Willys Overland sales skyrocketed from $4 million to $138 million. It was the birthplace of today's recreational market of the SUVs that you see running around. Before the concept of the Jeep, there was no such thing in that size of a vehicle or anything close to that size. So you can thank what you're driving around in today to essentially going back to those 49 days at the Butler plant. The Jeep's astronomical success in the civilian market, however, did not overshadow its crucial ongoing role in the military. In 1951, American troops were called to defend South Korea from the aggressions of the Communist North. Only months after their arrival, the simmering conflict erupted into a full-fledged war. Once again, the Jeep was sent to the battlefield. The standard World War II Jeep saw service right up through Korea. There were many, many uh, the World War II vehicles and Jeeps used because we had so many of them left over. However, there were some flaws that the government perceived that they wanted fixed. In the Korean War, the wounded were transported to army hospitals mainly in Jeeps as they had been in World War II. But the litters rigged to carry the men were unstable and ill-equipped for emergency medical care. Overland introduced the M-170, designed to carry a medical crew to care for wounded soldiers while in transit. During the Korean War, Army payloads dramatically increased in both size and weight. It was getting tougher for the little Jeep to keep up. To keep pace with these changes in military technology, the M38 model Jeep was introduced in 1950. The M38 itself almost looks like a World War II Jeep. It has flat hood and flat fenders. It has a waterproof uh, fording system in it, uh, different things that were added to it. Its most important improvement, a six-cylinder hurricane engine, enabled the M38 to carry larger payloads. But these modifications presented new problems. It had a little bigger engine in it. It had a higher center of gravity. And uh, it turned over more easily. I can remember a, uh, a famous maneuver in the wintertime in Germany when the roads were frozen. And I, uh, I wrecked seven. My driver and I wrecked seven of those vehicles. Not because he was not a good driver or I not a good rider. But it was just that the thing was terribly unstable. A decade later, in the midst of the Vietnam War, 
the Ford Motor Company introduced the M151, hoping to eliminate the weaknesses of the M38. With the M151 Jeep, they were trying to have that vehicle replace several of the earlier models or versions of the Jeep and do it all. Or they wanted it to become a reconnaissance vehicle. They wanted to add kits, become an ambulance. They wanted it to be a do-all vehicle, almost in a modular format. The most notable modification of the M151 was in its suspension. The M151 series vehicles incorporated an independent suspension, which was relatively revolutionary for the time. The difference between a regular suspension as used on the early Jeeps, which had solid axles, and the independent suspension on the M151s is that this independent suspension allowed all four wheels to be on the ground over any type of a terrain, therefore increasing traction. Instead of alleviating the Jeep's hazardous rollovers, however, the M151's newly designed suspension only compounded the problem. If the vehicle ever lifts up off the ground because of this independent suspension, what happens with each one of the wheels is they tuck in like this. So when they hit the ground, those wheels can collapse and the vehicle can roll over. Where with a solid axle Jeep, if you come off the ground, they're stuck to a solid axle, so they come right back down in the same width tread. Here in slow motion is an M151A1 being driven over a ramp at 15 miles per hour. Note the sharp steer to the left. This is at 15 miles an hour. So as a result, the M151 series had a tremendous number of accidents and fatalities with GIs and uh, even some civilian owners because of the fact that if they drove it improperly and it came up off the ground, they would roll and kill themselves. Modifications such as the addition of a roll bar failed to solve the problem. Tests conducted in the use of roll bars, seat belts, and shoulder harnesses reveal that safety cannot be guaranteed in a turnover situation. By the end of the Vietnam War in 1973, the U.S. Army Jeep had been in service for over 30 years. Militaries from South America to Southeast Asia had found it indispensable. And despite the numerous modifications, all Jeeps remained virtually identical to the dimensions and weight of the original Bantam prototype of 1941. But in the 1980s, the heyday of the Jeep would come to a close. Advancements in military weaponry and tactics would bring new demands upon battlefield vehicles and give way to a new breed of military transportation. In the years following the Vietnam War, the weaponry and vehicles of the U.S. arsenal became increasingly high-tech. But while the military was becoming ever more sophisticated overall, its workhorse, the Jeep, was still using 1940s technology. They were first off getting very old and, and as they say, long in tooth. Uh, the industry, uh, the automotive industry, was able to do a lot more things with newer materials, including composites and plastics, which they weren't able to do back in the 40s and 50s when they built and designed the Jeep. By the late 1970s, the U.S. Army recognized that the Jeep's military future was over. After more than 30 years of service, the Jeep was retired. With the demise of the Jeep, the Army was forced to address the crucial problem of mobility once again. In order to do that, you need to take a look at the battlefield and decide what it's going to look like in the future battlefield, because that's where the thing's going to fight. How far do you want it to be able to drive without refueling? What kind of protection do you have to have? That means what is the threat? So you really begin with an evaluation of the threat. The Army envisioned a new jack-of-all-trades vehicle that could carry more passengers and equipment than the Jeep, tow larger and heavier loads, and achieve higher speeds. The behemoth that was delivered to the military was designed by A.M. General, a distant relative of the Willys Overland Company. It was called the High Mobility Multi-Purpose Wheeled Vehicle, or Humvee.
feet wider and more than three feet longer than any Jeep. Despite its massive size, it was designed to meet crucial Army specifications. Most of the wars we've fought in the past century have occurred in the European theater. 144 inches is the maximum width allowable in European tunnels for trains. That's as far wide as you can get. So no vehicle made for the United States military is wider than that. The Humvee sat twice as high off the ground as the Jeep and could easily clear obstacles that would stop any other vehicle in its tracks. Up here is where the clearance numbers are measured, and that's 16 inches from the ground. The standard uh, off-wheel vehicle today, Fords, Chevys, and so forth, are anywhere from 7 to 8 inches in clearance. So this is double. And obviously the wider stance or the wider vehicle also allows better balance in very, t uh, very high uh, angle terrain. Powered by a V8 diesel engine with a 25-gallon fuel capacity, the Humvee had more than double the horsepower of the most sophisticated Jeep. It even had the remarkable ability to drive underwater. It was designed not to float. It is specifically designed to sink immediately. And it's done for a reason. They don't want you to lose the tread on the ground. So as you hit water, most vehicles will float for a while before they go down and then start to be able to drive. This vehicle can go through any level of water, any level of lake, any level of anything, as long as water does not get in through the air filter for your diesel. They put this at the high point of the vehicle. Now in the military, they also have a periscope. So they're able to raise this up and they also raise up the mufflers. This will go into a lake or a pond nonstop and just continue along the bottom, literally, until you run out of gas or your breath. The Humvee also performs other tricks that enable it to overcome the most difficult terrain. From the cab, on the move at any time, you can inflate and deflate the tire pressure for anywhere from zero to 50 pounds per square inch. And what that really does is expand the tire pattern or tread, the footprint, and allows you much more uh, contact with the road for less slippage. The Humvee was subjected to months of brutal army testing. But its toughest challenge was yet to come. In 1990, the Humvee was dispatched on its first call to duty, the Persian Gulf War. When a massive three-week air assault failed to dislodge Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, the U.S.-led coalition began a ground war led by a formidable array of mechanized fighting machines. Leading the modern cavalry charge into Kuwait was the Humvee. How do you feel about leading the charge in a Humvee? I think it's great. These vehicles went out there untested in a combat environment, untested in such large quantities. If this broke down and you couldn't get parts, you had a problem. So it was really, as they say, a lot of nail biting going on at that point when these were deployed. On the first night of the attack, there was a Marine Corps uh, group that was out front that was guarding a supply, forward supply area, with fuel and so forth. And the Iraqis had uh, an attack going, and there was fog and so forth. And the only equipment they had besides their, their personal weapons, their M16s, were Humvees with a couple M60 machine guns on top. And they used these to repel the attack long enough until the Air Force could come and use uh, fighter aircraft and uh, bombers to knock back the Iraqi attack. So these vehicles held it off to keep that resupply depot available for helicopters and other vehicles that came through. In the unforgiving Arabian desert, over 20,000 Humvees exceeded the Army's highest expectations. It's a statement by a, a, an Iraqi uh, brigade commander who said something to this effect, that the, uh, the United States Air Force bombed us for three weeks and we lost a few tanks and some people. Uh, and then along came the 2nd Cavalry and we lost the whole brigade in an afternoon. On the battleground and behind the lines, the Humvee played many roles, from missile launcher to ambulance. The new vehicle even withstood unusual testing from the soldiers of Desert Storm. The game they used to play during the Gulf War was to see who could get the vehicle stuck in the bogs and the mud. They were never able to do it. They were that good. As the Jeep before it, the Humvee's performance and popularity on the battlefield aroused curiosity on the home front. The initial public reaction when this vehicle came out was more like uh, they were laughing at it. Yeah, who would own this thing? Uh, this is ridiculous. 
But when Arnold Schwarzenegger expressed interest in purchasing a Humvee, the radical new vehicle caught on with the public. His civilian Humvee, or Hummer, was aptly nicknamed the Terminator. He actually went to the factory to see the whole assembly line, and the first civilian one that came off the line he bought. And as I understand it today, he has five of them. World War II correspondent Ernie Pyle called the Jeep faithful as a dog, strong as a mule, agile as a goat. When asked how the Allies won the war, Eisenhower, Patton, and Churchill all listed the Jeep among the most crucial factors. I think the spirit of the Jeep still lives in, in the concept and the idea of the Humvee. It's still the idea to provide a full-use vehicle for off-road capability. I miss the Jeep. It's still here in the form of the Wrangler, but I don't think it's gone either. It, it'll be back. From the horse, to the Jeep, to the Humvee, success in battle has always depended on mobility. As long as men continue to fight wars, victory will belong to those who can move.